Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to be turning to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, while you're um, turning there, I have been considering starting a prayer list. We used to do that and kind of uh, drop the ball, and sometimes it helps us to remember a little bit and uh, be more mindful of people. So, uh, Lord willing, we'll start doing that next Sunday. 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. Therefore he sent thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city. And when the servant of, and when the, servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, Behold, a host of horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And when the Lord opened his, the eyes of the young men, the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite the people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither this is the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this book. Lord, we praise you for the comfort it's been to us down through the years and through the good times and through the hard times, how it has brought us joy. We pray now that you would bless it once again to the hearts of the hearers. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ Jesus' name when we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, some very familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, we'll be looking at a number of places, which I rarely do. Uh, but my thought this morning is, is God done with you? And I'll have to say the majority... Uh, well, everybody really in this room that I can answer that question, he's not done with you. Because when he's done with you, your time runs out. You know when I'm done working at the nursing home? Now, uh, they don't let you cheat anymore. I can't get somebody to go in and punch my time clock for me on the little cards. Y'all all remember them and how they would run down through there because now you have to clock in with your finger. And if, you, if you're not there, you're not there, and you don't get any money. But, you know, I have to keep moving until the end of the day, until I go like this, and I'm clocked out, I'm still there, right? And if they say, Larry, can you do this? Larry, can you do that? You know what? I have to say yes and go get the job done. Now, we like to think sometime that we're done that I've done all I can do, I'm through. But what we really need at those times is a rest and not a quit. So uh, I'll answer my question as I pose it to you. No, God is not done with you. Now in our text, we have a lot of uh, he's that are never answered, a lot of pronouns that we don't know whom the Bible is speaking of just yet. So I want to review our text, and then we're going to go to a couple of different places. Uh, first of all, back in verse 14, it says, And he said, now the he here is, uh, is the king that, or the advisor of the king that said, uh, this is where Eli Elisha is at. This is where he is at the moment. Now, 
uh, just above this is a great compliment to the person of Elijah, and they said, what can we do with him? He knows all what's going on in the king's chambers. In other words, God had told him so much of the enemy of God, he knew exactly what the enemy was doing before he did it. And this was very upsetting to the enemy of God. Listen, this morning, if you get in tune with Christ and you're hearing things before they happen, listen, you know what? Uh, the devil's going to get mad about it. He's going to be upset. If you're so in tune with Christ, he says, go to Mexico and you get on the next plane headed that way. Christ is pleased and the devil is infuriated. Remember, your service never pleases the devil, but rather makes him angry, unless you quit. And if you quit, the devil, Lucifer himself, will applaud you and be very glad that you are done serving Christ. And so the he here is that person, the, the, the individual that said this is where he's at. Now, remember that's a true, say, a, a true statement. He did know where he was at. And he said, go spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore he, again meaning the, the king, sent thither horses and chariots and a great host that they may come by night and compass the city. Now, now we see the second piece of this because of Elisha's faith, faithful servants, service the whole city's in trouble. Now, that can work two ways. You can be serving the Lord well here at New Testament Church and, and, and get the whole pile in trouble with the devil. Or you can be sitting on your seat of do nothing and get us in trouble with God. Now, which would you rather be in trouble with? Now, if I had to be in trouble with one or the other, I'd rather be in trouble with Satan because he's the enemy of God. I would rather be, I would rather be in God's good graces than be uh, okay with the devil. And I'm not sure that most feel that way in the modern day in which we live. I think a lot of people even might believe that they can please both at the same time. And that is not the truth. That is a lie right out of the pits of hell. Verse 15, and when the servant of the man of God was risen early. Now, this is not Gehazi. If you will, keep your finger there in 2 Kings 6 and turn back with me to 2 Kings 5 and verse 24. Uh, 2 Kings uh, verse 5 and verse 24. In, in verse 24, and when he came to the tower, he took him from the hand and bestowed, and bestowed them in the house, and he let him go, and they departed. Now, all the he's and personal pronouns here, the main one is Gehazi. Now, I'll remind you that Gehazi uh, was the servant of Elisha, very much like Elisha was the servant of Elijah. But see, Gehazi did not have what it took to get to the end. In other words, he was swayed and swayed by money. He, he did not keep, uh, he was not faithful to what God had to do, had for him to do. And you know, he started out pretty good. You, you, you remember uh, when the Shumanite woman was running and her boy had died and Gehazi ran and threw her to the side because nobody was supposed to touch Elisha. And Elisha said, let her alone, let her come up here. Pretty faithful servant. But then they do another great thing and they send him some money. 
Now, Gehazi knew that Elisha was not going to take it. But he took it. You know the old saying, everybody has their price. Don't let that be said of you. Don't let that be said that you have a quitting place on money. So Gehazi went and hid this money so his master would not know about it. Verse 25, and he, meaning Gehazi, went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. Now, first of all, he lied to God's man. Now, you know what? Uh, if you lie to me, okay. The Bible says that uh, really in, in one sense, I am no prophet. What, what my title really is in the church age is an under shepherd. In other words, whatever he tells me, I, I, I pass along to you to keep you safe. That's what a shepherd does. He feeds his flock and he keeps them safe. And uh, that's really my only role. But in that day, again, Elisha and the Lord God was like this. He done knew what Gehazi had done. He, and just like he knew what was going on in the king's palace, he knew exactly what Gehazi had done because the Lord gave it to him. Verse 26, Gehazi lies. And he said unto him, Went not my heart, uh, excuse me, the Elijah, Elisha says to Gehazi, and he said unto him, Went not my heart or my spirit with thee? And the, and the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee. Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? You talk about a treasury. Listen, these people, this guy didn't pay them like Baptists did. He gave them things over and over, even give him some slaves. That'd be hard to turn down, wouldn't it? Now, we've been taught from little bitty that slavery is completely evil. First of all, let me say that is not true. I'm a slave. I was bought with a price, a very expensive price. And if my master says, jump, I just need to ask, how high would you like me to jump? I'll get this fat body up as far as I can. Right? But mankind doesn't like that thought. And so that, th their, their real attitude against slave, slaves is not the slaves themselves. It's the obedience. That's what I have found. And, and, and so we see what, what a lucrative thing. And Gehazi... Knowing, knowing the heart of the man of God knew he would not even take a dime of it. So he took it himself. Gehazi chose, shows his true colors. Now, if you don't know who did this, it was Naaman. Remember the one that went into the water seven times? Elisha's prescription was Gehazi go tell him to go wash in, in the Jordan River seven times. And that's where all this wealth came from. His sentence, verse 27. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. That's the end of Gehazi. His service was over. Now, it was over for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, because he rebelled against God. He did not follow the advice of his master. And last but not least, he took a bribe. We never hear of Gehazi again. Uh, according to the word of God, seeing what happened here, he died with leprosy, right? And so this other individual is a newbie. You remember when the Lord first saved you? You were a newbie. I remember when I first got out of nursing school, I was a newbie. 
And there was a lot of things I didn't know, and there was a lot of procedures that I was licensed to do. And this will scare you the next time you have a student nurse. I was licensed to do them, and I'd never done them. <laughs> right? A newbie. A newbie in the face of the enemy. That's pretty scary, isn't it? But that's exactly the situation that this servant uh, found himself was in the very eyeball of the enemy and just a new one. A new one. Go with me now to 1 Kings chapter 6. This time we're going to the first verse. So we have this judgment of Gehazi. And now we have this very unusual circumstance that should be teaching this young servant. He saw the judgment. Uh, he saw the judgment of Gehazi. And now in 2 Kings chapter 6, the first verse, we see something else. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, and he was probably in this group, Behold now, the place where we dwell, we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Now, I used to think that man, that it was cramping their lifestyle too much to, to live like a priest. But no, they literally were meaning, hey, our house is too small. You know what? In the winter months when I was a kid, we lived in two rooms, the living room and the kitchen, and we slept on the couches. That was a two-room house. You know what? I would have been right there with Elisha's servant, say, and, and, you know, it was just me and Judy and Mama, and, you know, uh, a teenage boy with two women. I mean, it was, it was the most horrible circumstance you could think of. But I, I told Mama many times, I'm like, man, Mama, this place is just too small for us. Now, it didn't, it didn't get me anywhere, but, I mean, at least I said it, right? And uh, so... We find then that they weren't asking for a lot. Apparently, they were going to build a larger living quarters. Now, do you remember how many is included in this group? 400. Because remember, there was, uh, they, they would later see the, the catching away of Elisha. And they would stop, and there would be less and less and less going. Well, that was Elijah, excuse me. But they would, uh, the same individuals, the same prophets. So, you know, they needed, a, they needed a dormitory. They needed a place to stay. And so, apparently, Elisha put his blessings on it, and they go to build a log house, uh, somewhere better for them to live. Verse 2, let's go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us, uh, and make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, go ye. In other words, you have my blessing. You can do this. The one said, be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servant. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, so the servant is there, so he went with them, when they came to Jordan, and they cut down wood. And as one was fell in a tree, uh, fell in a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he shewed them a place, and he cut down a stick and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Now, that's a miraculous thing. And I, I grew up close enough to a creek. I could throw a rock and almost hit it from my front porch. And you know what? I saw a lot of things in that old creek down through the years, but I never seen. There's a lot of metal in that creek. I mean, it was literally where the iron furnace threw stuff they didn't want. I've seen iron bars in it. But you know what? I never did see one float. It's against the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is beyond what we, as, under, as we understand what is scientifically possible. But it is, you know, that's why I get it. 
what the Bible says, all things are possible with God. It goes against the normal. It goes against what we understand as physics. It goes against that. And so God's man came and the axe floated right on up. That's miraculous. You know, wouldn't you love to see something like that? Now, uh, I trust him explicitly with my soul. And I've never seen an axe head float. I've never seen the dead brought back to life. Uh, I've never seen uh, 5,000 fed with two fishes and, and some bread. Uh, but I'd like to. And you'd like to, if you were forthright and honest with me, wouldn't you love to see something like that? A heavy, heavy axe uh, head coming up. And you know what, what I think is, is most interesting about that statement? It said that it swam. It, it, it come up and it did swim. You know what that, I think that means it's probably a little out further in the, in the River Jordan and swim back to shore for them. They didn't even have to jump in for it. That's God. That's the miraculous work of God. Now, when we have events in our life, listen, dear friend, they're there for a purpose. And it will prepare you for something else. Mm -hmm. Now, I've never, I've never seen the dead raised alive, but I have seen cures come out of nowhere. I, I, I've never saw uh, people come out of the grave, but I saw the filthiness of lost people brought into the family of God. You know what? That is dead to life. I saw that many, many times, and it's glorious and, and miraculous, just as miraculous as an axe head floating, and this boy saw that happen. He was experienced. He, he, he was gaining knowledge of how God works. Verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, in such and such a place shall, shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou, that thou pass not a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once, <laughs> nor twice. Now, in other words, the, the Syrians were coming to get them, and they, they knew where the king was. Again, not the prophet, but the king. And he knew where to move. Now notice what your text says. Not once, not twice. So we know at least this happened three times. And who was seeing it? Who, who saw deliverance out of nowhere? This little servant boy. Hopefully, he's gaining momentum. Hopefully, he's beginning to see and, and know how to trust God. Now, he saw the axe head float. Now, he saw the king's life preserved at least three times. That's God. You know, you know if you're stressed about death this morning, I can tell you when you're going to die. I'm just like a prophet, right? Exactly when God wants you to die. What does the Bible say? Genesis, I mean, excuse me, Psalms chapter 90. Te teach us to number our days. Mm -hmm. Our days are numbered. You'll live 70 years and by strength 80 years. Your days are numbered. So, what we do with the time we have is everything. Well, wouldn't you be like to be so in the will of God that you would understand when, when, acts, uh, when the end of the acts floats and, and the deliverance of God's people, what that really means and see it time and time again and gain, gain confidence in the God that you serve. And that's exactly what this young man, young man, had enjoyed. 
Now, in our text, it becomes personal. You know what I found among God's people after 30 years? We can glory to God here. But it's hard to glory to God here. When it, when, when it becomes personal, was the axe head floating personal to this man? I don't think so, because he was, he was Elisha's servant. He wasn't going to live in the new house. In fact, he said, he said you remember he said he wanted to go, and Elisha gave him permission, go. You can watch him build it. And then he sees this great miracle with the axe head floating. Now, you talk about something that would be neat. The defiance of all, all we know uh, uh, about science and, and that piece of metal floating up to the top and then swimming into shore. But that's out there, isn't it? You ever think about how Bible stories sometimes seem way out there somewhere? Now, do we believe they're real? Yeah. But you, the, the closest miracle that we can find recorded in, in, in the Bible was in the apostolic times, right? That's been more than 2,000 years ago, right? Are, are we connected with that? And we talk, uh, we, we talk about Lazarus being raised from the dead, and, and we say, Amen! What about if you were the one that was dead? That brings it a little closer home, doesn't it? What about if it's your child that's so sick you don't know what else, what else to do? That brings it closer to home, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So after the axe head went for a swim, he saw the deliverance of the king. Right? We read about the deliverance of Israel time and time and time again. But do you, do you really know it? You know who understands deliverance the best? Those of us who have been saved. I was delivered from a creature that I no longer am. What more could be glorious than that? But now, this servant, and we never hear him named, we don't know if he was faithful to the end or not, because we don't, we don't even know his name. Right? We see him where it gets down to home. Now, the thing about servitude, again, that we really don't think about, the servant is always with the master. Remember, way back, uh, was it, no, was it Solomon? Uh, the leader, the spiritual leader of God's people had gotten so far from God, and uh, I think it was, Maybe Elijah, Elijah that had come into the temple, he'd been given to the Lord. And I may not even have that character right. But remember what he said? God called him. Samuel. Samuel. Thank you. And he ran into his master and said, what do you need? He said, I didn't call you. Went back to bed. Happened two more times. And finally, the leader goes, oh, God's calling him. And he said, if he calls you again, say, here, is, here, here am I. And he did. And he served the Lord all the days of his life. Now, that, that is a, a miraculous event. But we find this young boy not having those experiences. Samuel, all the days of his life, again and again, from the anointing of David to the very end, saw God, proved God, saw God's strength time and time and time and time again. 
and now we have this little newbie. All we have documented is four times seeing the power of God. The axe handle flowed, Israel delivered three times, and now it becomes very personal. Alas, alas, what shall we do? Now, that we in there, again, is a personal pronoun, and that means us. If I said this morning, what are we going to do in 2024? Who am I talking to? I'm talking to you and me both at the same time, right? We. So the little boy knew he had to contribute something. And he knew Elisha well enough that he felt he had confidence in him. And so we find Elisha, as always, shows his spiritual understanding of the situation and said, Lord God, open his eyes that he may see that those that be with us are more mighty than those that are with them. Now, how do you suppose Elisha knew that? He was already seeing through the spiritual eye. See, you don't think, see through the spiritual eye just by happenstance. He had been close to the Lord all those years. He knew what was going on down in the king's house. And he certainly knew spiritually they were all around him. He had no reason to fret. Chariots of fire. Can you imagine that? And so then we find, what is he going to do? Now, do you think, I, do you think Elisha could have said, charge! And the chariots take off and just annihilate everybody in the path. I believe they could have, and I believe they would listen to it. But what did he do? He didn't kill those people. He went down there. He said, Lord, smite him with blindness. Now, that doesn't mean like this kind of blindness. Don't let him identify me. And he went down there and said, hey, that bunch went off to Syria. <laughs> and they believed him. <laughs> and they left for Syria. You know, that's a merciful man, isn't it? Had the ability to say, kill every one of them. And he did. He just sent them on their way. See, I think we have to be that kind of person if we want to see what God's doing, don't you? I want to see what God's doing, don't you? Listen, you won't see what God is doing by just sitting around. You won't be able to see what God's doing wasting time. You won't be able to see what God's doing with a mediocre prayer life. You won't be able to see what God's doing unless you get into that book like you should and read it and read it and read it again. That's how you get there. Very close relationship with our God. Now, this last thing. You want a personal, close relationship. Now that Word of God is everything. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But, with that said, a personal relationship goes much deeper than that. And that's what you have to have. You know what? I believe Elisha knew the law inside and out, don't you? He'd been around for at least 400 years, maybe more than that by then. And he was God's man for that day. But see, he didn't get that closeness by memorizing the law, did he? He got it through prayer. He got it for listening to a good man before him named Elijah by spending time and time and more time 
with Batman. And then he began to be able to see some things. And back, remember, old Elijah encouraged him, say, you stay behind. I, 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 I want to sin by myself. And he said, not so, my Lord. Not so. And he got to see it. He caught his mouth. And from that day forward, God used him in an unbelievable way. You need that closeness. You know why we stress out sometimes? We lack closeness with our Lord. We lack nearness unto Him. Then, then the headlines will stress you out. But if we're close, if we're near unto Him, we'll know what the King's doing in His palace. Now, I'm not sure I want to know what... what uh, President Biden is doing in his palace. But I believe I could. You see what I'm saying? Do you believe that? Or do you believe miracles are lim li limited to eons ago? See, I'm, I don't. I believe they still happen every day. What we lack is the closeness. You know, I've often wondered <laughs> I'd love to be able to have my eyes open one time in this little church building and see the spiritual things going on. Now, some preachers say, well, I can see, I can read their face. I kind of know what they're mean, but see, faces can fool you, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Poker face. Pretend like nothing's bothering you, you know? You got four aces and you're like, what? Well, you know, that's, that's your poker face. But, not talking about that. You know what your situation is, is between you and the Lord. But I wonder, I wonder what kind of devils is meeting with us right now. Yeah. <clears throat> that's a real thing, right? Was it the church? at uh, uh, Testament uh, Church at, uh, it wasn't Philadelphia. Anyway, one of the seven churches at Laodicea, uh, seven churches of the Revelation, it said, I know where Satan's seat is. It's the church at Ephesus. It was the church at Ephesus. And you know what? Ephesus was a mission-minded church. And they had Satan's seat. So if he opened our eyes spiritually, I believe we would see, you know, just like they did, the, the, the house full of chariots of fire. But at the same time, the demons that are around would shake us in our shoes. See what I'm saying? You know how you get there? Closeness to the Lord. Closeness to the Lord. That's how you arrive there. You ever, you ever been invited to go somewhere and you're like, no, I don't think I'm going? Now, when I say that, don't use fear as your excuse. Who's the author of fear? Yeah. Right? So if you're just afraid to go, that's you being lame. But if the Lord says you, Larry, you'd be better not to go. Mm-hmm then it's time to listen. I've had a few things like, a few times like that, and you know what? Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes there were car wrecks that I escaped to be in because I simply said, no, I don't think I'm going this time. That's our God. But you're not going to get that on the periphery, on the outside. You're only going to get that when you, like Elisha, Spend every day together. And that's a very hard, hard, hard thing to do. That's why the devil wants most of your time. Some of the days are getting shorter to you. Some of them barely fit what I need to do in, in the time that I have. You know why? 
Because the devil don't want you to give any of that precious time unto the Lord. Because if you give him that time, you know what? You're going to be closer to him. And the devil don't want that. Right. And so he's going to fill up your schedule double booked. Old Dr. Lee here in town, uh, one time, uh, one of the secretaries over there showed me Dr. Lee's schedule. And part of it, he was, every part of it, he was double booked. And in some appointment times, he was triple booked. You know what? He didn't have time for anything else, did he? Mm. No. That's, that's where Satan wants you. No time for anything else. 